Hi, my name is Michael Seidman. I am an otorhinolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, also known as an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. I received my Bachelor of Science degree in nutrition and my medical degree both from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. I did my residency training in otolaryngology and then did a fellowship in hearing, balance, facial nerve, skull base, acoustic neuroma, and cochlear implant surgery at the Ear Research Foundation in Florida. I am the primary surgeon at Henry Ford Health System who performs this type of sophisticated ear surgery. By definition, you have a chronic ear infection, which implies a hole in the ear, and usually, but not always, you will have experienced some drainage, ranging from once in your lifetime to all the time. Typically, the hole in the ear and the chronic low-grade infection causes a hearing loss, sometimes from the hole itself or from erosion of the three tiny bones called ossicles of hearing. I would like to show you some specific anatomy as this will help you understand the nature of your problem. Now, the ear is made up into three places. There is the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The external ear starts from the outside of the ear called the helix. It includes the external auditory canal, and it goes up to the eardrum. In the external auditory canal is where wax is, for example. If you have a blockage here, it can be irritating and can also cause some hearing loss. Now, the middle ear starts on the inside surface of the eardrum and it consists of the three of the smallest bones in our body called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, also called their hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. It is an air-containing space that connects to the back of the nose via the eustachian tube. Now if you look at the smallest bone of hearing, the stapes bone, it's the smallest bone in our body, right at that point on the inside surface of that starts the inner ear. And the inner ear consists of two major components. The vestibular component, which is responsible for balance. It has three semicircular canals, a saccule, and a utricle. And also the cochlea, which is the snail shell shaped organ responsible for hearing. And then both of these are connected to nerves or via nerves into the brain. And you can see that the nerves to balance from the vestibular system are here, as well as the nerve for the cochlea or the hearing nerve and the facial nerve all sit inside this little tiny internal auditory canal. And right here is where small tumors called acoustic neuromas, for example, can grow. Sometimes people also have what is called cholesteatoma. Cholesteatoma is the medical term for skin in the middle ear. Skin is okay and normal in the external ear, but if it gets into the middle ear, where the three small bones are, it is considered a potentially dangerous situation. I see this all the time, and the majority of people do just fine with routine ear surgery. Cholesteatoma is considered dangerous because it slowly erodes important structures. As you can see from this picture, if it erodes upward, you enter the brain. It can cause a brain abscess, infection, meningitis. If it erodes into the inner ear, it can cause permanent hearing loss that can't be corrected with a hearing aid, deafness. It can cause ringing in the ear, tinnitus, and balance problems, including spinning, vertigo, or lightheadedness. It can also erode into the facial nerve and cause paralysis of the face. Thus, this is a problem that requires surgical attention. The primary goals of surgery are to, number one, eradicate any long-term infection or cholesteatoma, Number two, fix or repair the hole in the ear if it's present. And three, to improve the hearing if possible. We do this by restructuring the three ear bones, either using a man-made prosthesis, like a top called total ossicular prosthesis, or a pop called partial ossicular prosthesis. We can also use your own bone called the incus. And the last goal is to create a safe ear. There are several operations that we do depending upon the nature of your problem. Most people can be treated with either of the following operations. Tympanoplasty, tympanoplasty with mastoidectomy, radical mastoidectomy with meatoplasty, which means to open up the hole in the ear, and tympanoplasty as well, and revision of any of the above surgeries. I'm going to explain these in some detail. Tympanoplasty means to explore the middle ear, to remove any disease, rebuild the eardrum, and also to reconstruct the middle ear bones if necessary. Many times for a small hole in the ear we are doing just a tympanoplasty and the middle ear bones are perfectly fine and no reconstruction is necessary. This is an outpatient procedure that takes approximately one and a half, one and a half hours if it's straightforward or two and a half hours if it is more difficult. You will typically have a preoperative appointment with a nurse from the anesthesia team who will determine your needs and discuss some of what to expect. 
On the day of surgery, we will rediscuss the ear that we are planning to operate on, and I will answer any further questions that you might have. An intravenous line is typically started unless you're a child, in which case they start the line after you are asleep. And this is really at the discretion of the anesthesia team. You are then taken into the operating room, and appropriate monitors are attached to your body to check things such as your heart function, oxygen saturation, temperature, blood pressure, and the list goes on. The anesthesiologist then gives you medicine and maybe a mask over your face to help you fall asleep. Once you are asleep, I place special monitors with regard to your facial function. This allows me to monitor your facial nerve, which is always in close proximity when doing ear surgery. The facial nerve monitor reduces but does not guarantee that you won't have a risk of a facial nerve injury. I've done several thousand ear operations at this time and I'll tell you about it in just a moment and, and rarely do you ever have any problems with the facial nerve but it is a risk. After that I shave about two inches of hair behind your ear and then we sterilize your skin with betadine or some other agent if you have a known allergy to this compound. The incision is made behind the ear so it is relatively hidden. To rebuild your eardrum, I use something called temporalis fascia, which is the covering of the muscle used for chewing. If you bite down, you can see this over in this region here. This really has no bearing on the muscle, and it is not something that you will miss or feel after surgery. I then remove any disease from your middle ear, and then assess the bones of hearing to make sure that they are connected and working appropriately. If not, I may do what is called an osculoplasty or ossicular chain reconstruction, which basically means to reconnect your hearing mechanism. Sometimes I am able to use your second bone of hearing, called the incus, and do what is called an incus interposition graft, where I interpose it between the malleus and the stapes. Other times I use a sterile man-made prosthesis called a pop or a top, as I briefly alluded to earlier. I also place some gel foam, which is a sponge-like material in your ear to help stabilize a prosthesis and to support the fascia graft. And if you think about it, you have an eardrum here, and if you put the graft inside and there's a space there, it would fall away unless you support it. So the gel foam keeps it from falling away from the hole in the ear and helps in healing. This gel foam takes about six to eight weeks to fully dissolve, so most people have more hearing loss immediately after surgery. And this may gradually improve as a gel foam dissolves. Sometimes I need to put in something called silastic sheeting. It is a plastic silicone but safe like material that reduces scarring and adhesions. This can stay inside the ear or your mastoid forever. I rarely will remove it if you need a second procedure, sometimes I will. The primary risks of any ear operation include but are not limited to things like bleeding and infection which are usually less than 1%. Change your loss of sense of taste and about half of my patients experience this sensation. It usually resolves in days up to six months. Theoretically can be permanent in some people, but this is very unusual. This is because the taste nerve, also cause, called the corda tympani nerve, runs right through the middle ear space. In some people with cholesteatoma, this may already be eroded, and most people don't even notice or didn't notice the change in taste as it was so gradual. It can oftentimes give you a bitter metallic taste inside the mouth. There is also a risk to the facial nerve as this runs right through the middle ear and mastoid. As I have mentioned, I have done thousands of ear surgery and I have never injured the facial nerve from routine ear operations. I did operate on a child who had had eight previous mastoid tympanoplasty operations elsewhere and I was asked to do his ninth operation. After surgery, he had facial weakness which resolved after one week. Again, very unusual. So again, the use of the facial nerve monitor reduces the risk of facial paralysis, but does not guarantee against it. Other risks include recurrence of cholesteatoma, if you had it in the first place. This is actually one of the most common occurrences and is usually secondary to the disease process itself. Cholesteatoma is said to recur in about 20 to 50 percent of the cases. In my experience, it recurs in about 20 to 25 percent of patients. Some surgeons will automatically recommend a second look procedure where we come back to the operating room and reoperate six to 12 months later after the initial surgery. It's called a second look operation. And I base this decision on the extent of the cholesteatoma. If there is only a small cholesteatoma that is easily removed, I will not routinely recommend a second look. However, if there is a significant amount of cholesteatoma, it is advised to go back and re-explore the ear in six to 12 months. Typically, in children, cholesteatoma tends to be a bit more aggressive than in adults. Other risks include complete hearing loss because you're operating on the ear, ringing because the ear couldn't theoretically ring, and permanent balance disturbances, but these are really few and far in between. 
nonetheless, they can occur. Most surgeons will tell you that they have about an 80 to 85 percent success rate at closing the hole in the eardrum and eliminating any drainage. In my hands, the success rate is about 95 percent. We are very good, but we're not perfect. Another very possible occurrence is slipping of the incus interposition graft, if I had to reconstruct the ear bones, or the top or the pop, whichever is used. In most routine tympanoplasty surgery, the bones of hearing are intact, but when they are not, we attempt to reattach them. They are the smallest bones in the body, and if they slip off from where I've placed them by even one-tenth of a millimeter, a tiny, tiny amount, the hearing will be bad again. Options, if this happens to you, include doing nothing and just living with it because usually people had the hearing loss beforehand, wearing a hearing aid, or attempting a revision osciculoplasty. I can tell you that there are some patients who have wanted to go back about 10 or 11 different times, and finally on the 11th time we got it to stay and work. Other people, we get it on the first time, and other people have had, I've had it perfectly placed, and they got into a car accident, and then it slipped out of position. When using your own incus to reconstruct, I will sometimes, with your permission, use cyanoacrylate glue, which is essentially super glue. I have found that my success rate of the bones staying right where they belong has increased to about 80%. I must tell you that this is not an FDA-approved use, but I have found that in medicine there are many things that we do routinely that are not FDA-approved. Nonetheless, if you would rather I did not use the glue, please tell me beforehand and I will certainly abide by your wishes. Most people who, most surgeons, who are honest with you about the results will tell you that about half of their patients have improvement in hearing when you have to work on the bones of hearing. If you just have a hole in the ear, most of those patients have an improvement in hearing. Since using the super glue, our results have improved to again about 80% and there appears to be no risk from using the glue. We only use a tiny drop. I can also tell you that Dr. Shiro Fujita, who is now deceased, who used a lot of super glue in the ear for other problems, used to practically fill the middle ear space up with super glue, and he's done this on over 170 patients without any untoward effects. I am using the tiniest of a drop, and it seems to help. But again, if you'd prefer I didn't use it, and that's only if I have to do an incus interposition graft, I can't use it with the top or the pop because it'll essentially melt that stuff, but it does not melt the bone. In any event, after surgery, you will experience some pain. This is typically well controlled with Tylenol with codeine or Darvacet if you are allergic to codeine. And everybody's pain tolerance is different. Some are back to work the next day, many of my patients are, while others require up to a week off. That's pretty unusual. 24 hours after surgery, you need to remove the head bandage. You start by washing your hands thoroughly, because I want clean hands. Then you cut the gauze bandage right down the middle of your forehead, and you carefully remove the entire dressing. There will be a cotton ball which you should change daily or as often as it is saturated. If it requires changing more than every hour, I need to be called. You must be careful because there is also a one to two inch piece of gauze called new gauze, which is the outside packing in the ear canal. If this comes out just a little bit, you can gently tuck it back in because your hands are nice and clean. If it is all the way out, leave it out. Don't put it back in. There is more packing deeper. You should remove the steri strips, which are band-aid like material behind the ear about seven days after surgery. I will remove the inside packing in the office typically in seven to 14 days. And at that time, you will begin using drops in the ear, typically once or twice per day for about seven to 14 days. You will then need to be seen about every two to four weeks until the ear is completely healed, which is typically three weeks if you're fast and three months if you are slow. Just so you are not surprised, it is normal for the ear to stick out a bit. This will gradually go down over weeks to months. Sometimes it sticks out permanently, but this is usually very subtle and not noticeable. Provided you don't have my hairline, you can grow your hair a little bit longer and cover that up. But again, most people don't have that problem. Many people complain of numbness of the ear because you need to make an incision behind the ear, cut behind the ear. And occasionally there will be some shooting pains, but this goes away with time. There are some important restrictions as you can see up here. Number one, no forceful nose blowing. If you sneeze, be sure that your mouth is open. Some people will sneeze and go, <clears throat> you don't want to do that because you can actually lift the graft off. No lifting of more than five to 10 pounds until further notice, and usually that's four to six weeks, and no straining. I've had several patients who are professional trumpet players, uh, can't do that until the ear is completely healed. You also have to keep your ear dry until further notice. Three weeks if it's quick, three months if it's slow. The second major part of the operation, which can either be done alone or in tandem with a tympanoplasty, and usually is done, is usually is done in tandem with a tympanoplasty, is called the mastoidectomy. The mastoid is the hard bone behind your ear. You can feel it. 
It looks a little bit like a honeycomb on the inside, and its purpose is to help aerate the middle ear, to keep it well aerated. In people with chronic infection or cholesteatoma, it is no longer doing what it's supposed to do and often is the source of the chronic infection. Thus, in these situations, I will often recommend performing a mastoidectomy. This essentially means to remove the mastoid bone. This is done with a drill and the microscope. The procedure adds to me about 15 to 30 minutes to the operation to the tympanoplasty. Some surgeons, including myself, feel that this increases the chance of success of the tympanoplasty and reduces the likelihood of a chronically draining ear or recurrence of the cholesteatoma. As I mentioned earlier, with the tympanoplasty surgery, most surgeons report about an 80 to 85 percent success rate, while I enjoy about a 95 percent success rate. I believe one reason is because, more often than not, I will recommend a mastoidectomy at the same time. If you only have a hole and have never had drainage, a mastoidectomy is not necessary. But if you've had a problem with drainage or cholesteatoma, the mastoidectomy will help eliminate additional disease and increase the rate of success. The risks in general of mastoid surgery are the same as with tympanoplasty. The borders of the mastoid cavity are the brain above, so you can get into the brain, but I've never actually had that happen, as well as behind. Also, the facial nerve is deep within, and we usually identify that, I typically identify it on each case. And also the semicircular canals, which are responsible for balance. I can tell you that recently I was asked because a doctor had actually injured the semicircular canal and entered the ear and that will cause deafness and chronic balance problems. And I was asked if that is, you know, a big problem. Of course it's a big problem. It shouldn't really happen, but it does and it can happen. It's just very unusual. In the several thousand operations that I've done, I've never had it happen, but it's a risk. So any of these structures can be entered and injured. I have seen all these complications occur from other places, but they have never happened to me, and I have been doing this type of surgery since 1986. Nonetheless, they are real risks. They do occur. I must tell you about them, but thankfully, they are extremely infrequent. Radical mastoid and ma meatoplasty surgery. In some cases, this type of surgery is necessary because, number one, the disease is too extensive to be amenable to a routine tympanoplasty or mastoidectomy. Uh, you may have already had a complication from the cholesteatoma, such as erosion into the inner ear, brain, or facial nerve. You may also have failed revision surgery, and in my judgment, anything less may simply not be enough to eradicate this disease. The surgery typically takes about two and a half to four hours, usually about two and a half for me, depending upon how extensive the disease is. The same preoperative and postoperative instructions apply. The risks are the same as with the other surgeries already mentioned. Recurrence of cholesteatoma or drainage is possible, but it's much less usual in this type of situation. In the olden days, that was the type of surgery they always did, was a radical mastoidectomy. The reason I don't like it is it leaves you with a maximal conductive hearing loss of about 40 or 50 decibels. So it's about half as good as your opposite ear if that's what has to happen, but sometimes it has to happen. For patients with this type of surgery, a meatoplasty is usually performed. This means that the hole inside your ear here, the ear canal, will be increased in size significantly, almost so that I can insert my uh, index finger or my thumb. And this is done because for the rest of your life, we need to debride the mastoid cavity on a semi-annual basis. That means every six months you come into my office, it takes me between five and 20 minutes to take all the disease out. It is typically non-painful and is similar to having wax removed from your ears. People tell me I'm very gentle, so I don't think it, it will really hurt or be uncomfortable for you. It's a little bit annoying. It's not as bad as going to the dentist's office where I used to cry when I was a, a young boy. So nonetheless, it's still annoying for some people. As an aside, and to emphasize the importance of routine debridement, I had two patients who had had this type of surgery performed someplace else, and for whatever reason, they did not follow up. One patient almost died and ended up with two brain abscesses, and one patient ended up with an erosion into the inner ear which caused permanent balance problems and complete hearing loss. When we perform a radical mastoidectomy, your hearing will typically be severely decreased, as I mentioned, but usually amenable to a hearing aid. I will be in to answer any questions that you may have, in summary, I would like to say that it is normal to be scared or nervous about any type of surgery. These particular types of surgeries are ones that I have performed thousands of times. I teach residents, medical students, and other doctors around the world to do this type of surgery. I also lecture and publish articles around the world related to these subjects. So all in all, I think you are in excellent hands. I know you will do well, and I will take the best possible care of you. Our anesthesia and nursing personnel are some of the best in the, in the country, and I have a great deal of faith and trust in all of them. They will always take wonderful care of you as well. Please tell me of any concerns or questions so that I can address them, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and I'll be in to speak with you shortly, and have a great day.